Well, hello, friends. We're back. It's Thursday at 1230. And wherever you are with your lunch, uh, we're glad you stopped to have a, a break with us. I'm Beth Bain. I am one of your mini missioners on the mission amplification team. And I'm here with my friend, Ellie Singer. Um, I am social media and multimedia specialist. So I'll be running tech in the background and uh, relaying all your questions live to Beth. So um, if you have any questions, any comments, concerns, um, suggestions, put those in the chat and I will convey them. For instance, Gwyn, yes, live. Thank you. <laughs> um, we are so glad to be here and we're so glad that you are here too. Well, to get us started, let me share my screen. And perfect. Here we go. So today we're in session two, and it is the stewardship letter. Boom, boom, boom. For many folks, it is the dreaded stewardship letter. So we're going to talk about some ways that it is going to be such a fun opportunity for you. So as we begin, uh, we will pray. And you know, Ellie, I realized. Somehow, I have never made sure this is on the stewardship page on the website, this prayer. So that would be something for us to, to get up. This is a prayer that was written particularly for the Diocese of Texas um, as we come together to think and pray about stewardship. Part of it is a familiar prayer from the Book of Common Prayer, and part was written just for us. So uh, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. generous and loving God. So draw our hearts to you. So God our minds. So fill our imaginations. So control our wills that we may be yours, utterly dedicated to your service. Use us and all of our resources, each minute of our day each of our humble gifts and talents, and even our finances, as you will. And always for your glory and for the welfare of your people, in and through and with the power of your spirit. Amen. Amen. So last week, uh, we began by talking about creating our plan for money stewardship. And we talked about how we went about creating a team that besides having diversity of, of kinds of folks in our congregation, that we would need three or four people that had a diversity in the way they gave. Uh, first, someone who's pledged one time, someone who's learning how to give. So looking at our team as being someone that tells the story of our church. Then we talked about creating a vision. And then in our money stewardship, one of the things that was helpful was looking at it as not a way to fund a budget, but as a way to tell our story, to build relationships, as a way to um, begin to look at how we can build relationships to fund the mission and ministry that God has uniquely called each of us to do. And we talked about that to create a timeline, particularly for our money stewardship mission, that if it were not hooked in to funding a budget, that it didn't have to be right now. We could actually create our budget based on what we received this year and actually talk about money stewardship any time of the year. We also talked about, whoops, let's go back one. We also talked about creating um, Every, taking every opportunity we had to talk about money, teach about money, preach about money, and not just about giving money, but helping the people in the congregation learn ways to manage their money better, to get out of debt, to tell how they feel about money. And that to have lots of opportunities to share and tell our story. And we're going to spend a whole time on that next time, talking about how we can effectively tell our unique story. And then finally, we cannot say thank you enough 
to all givers, to first time givers, to make sure that we write, do thank yous in personal ways. And so as part of the many, many opportunities that God gives us every time we gather for worship to say something about stewardship, we have our offertory sentences. And so our scripture today is one of those offertory sentences from the book of Hebrews. Through Christ, let us continually offer to God the sacrifice of praise, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge God's name. But do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. But do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. So the stewardship letter. When I was in a congregation, this was one of the most gut-wrenching, anxiety-producing anxiety things that we did all year. And we gave a lot more power to it than it probably had. Because the truth is that anytime we are, are in the midst of changing culture, that the stewardship letter is just one of at least 10 different touches we need to have in our congregation to tell our story. It's not the end all, it's one of many. Because if there was one magic thing we could do to invite people, to give money, to increase our financial resources, we would have already done it long ago and we could be doing something else right now. There is no one magic thing. This is one of many things to do. Some of them we've already talked about, but let's talk today about how this can be most effective. Before we do anything else, what is going to be the purpose of our stewardship letter? What is going to be the reason that we take all of this time to write something, put it in an envelope and mail it to someone? What is the result that we want? What do we want to communicate? What do we want to do? Being clear about what it is. If it's about getting people to give more money, well, then that's where all the focus needs to be. But why are we writing this letter and make sure that everything we do is on that point? Because I think there's probably some th more reasons to write a stewardship letter than just getting money. I think there's lots of reasons, but spending some time with whoever is charged with putting this together to think about what it is. Because I think at the heart of this, in our unique opportunity always, but particularly in Corona time, when people are starving for connection and relationship and purpose, that this is another one of those unique opportunities that we have through this written form to change the parish culture from stewardship as being about budget funding and instead move it towards making disciples. And churches, I don't think we have time to do anything more important than to focus most of, most of what we do is making disciples. And this is yet another opportunity. So before we begin anything, we are invited to pray, spend some time listening to God. And then, how do we create the letter? There are lots of letters that you can already get off the internet and just poke your stuff in them. I don't think that's going to be the best use of our resources. In fact, I think the people who create the letter actually get the most behavior change of anyone. And all of the time that we spend creating the letter, that small team that does it, they're thinking about stewardship, they're talking about stewardship, they're editing, they're proofing. They're the one whose behavior change because what we know about adult learners, 
what I'm doing right now where I'm just pouring knowledge into your head is the least effective way of learning. That the more we can have people connected and part of the process, the more behavior change is going to be. Because isn't that the purpose of our letter? It's to communicate and to change behavior. So how can we have lots of different hands and heads and prayers in the midst of this letter? One of the things that an idea that I saw was a church put together a Mad Libs for their stewardship letter. How many people have ever done Mad Libs? Ellie, do people still do, still do Mad Libs? Yeah, I've done Mad Libs growing up. Okay. So Mad Libs is where you get a list of, put a noun, put a verb, put an adjective, fill those out. And so there's two ways that this church could have done their stewardship letter. They could have, they got a letter with lots of blanks. And so they could have had someone put um, those words in. And so if, when they put it together, it would have been really, really funny. Their point would have still gotten across, but it would have been hilarious. Or they could have put together this stewardship letter and had people fill it out. Again, that would be a unique way to get people involved in the letter. So the team might have put together a process, but then other people would fill that in and it would be engaging. They've got some photographs and at the end, there was a place for someone to write in. This is what I think I'm going to give this year. This is one idea. Another thing Ellie and I were talking about um, when before we came together was the kind of stewardship letter that she might respond to. Could you tell us about that, Ellie? Yeah, um, so uh, if it isn't obvious just from my face and voice, um, I am like at the older end of Gen Z. I'm a digital native. I live on my devices, I know. Anyway, um, I don't receive much mail. I, re I don't even really receive bills in the mail because that's all done online. Um, so when I receive something, it's usually junk or like an ad for DSW or something like that. So I immediately filter out anything that looks corporate, anything that has a pre-printed stamp on it, anything where my name is typed on the front, unless it's specifically from like my health insurance or something like that. It's in the trash pretty immediately. But here's the thing is that because I don't get any mail, when somebody hand writes something to me, like, I don't know, a, a pen pal writes something to me, I get a birthday card, something like that, it becomes that much more precious as this tangible connection to somebody. And I actually get really excited. I don't know if anybody's watched Blue's Clues, but like there's that iconic opener in Blue's Clues where they're like, mail time, mail time. I think that's left an indelible mark on us or something because we get so excited about mail, but only authentic mail, if that makes sense. But I would love to get a handwritten stewardship letter. Like that would actually make my day. So Ellie's reminding us to make it distinctive. Um, since we met last week, I collected all the financial requests I got in the mail. All are the same size, except here's one that's a little smaller, but here's one from the Episcopal Church, here's one from a museum, here's one from Star of Hope, here's one from another museum, here's one from a monastery, yet another monastery, and here's one actually from Camp Allen. They're all the same shape. Only one or two actually have a distinctive stamp and they all have some kind of tight address on it. So if I were going to be sending a stewardship letter, I would make sure I had a, an adorable stamp, choose a stamp that goes with your stewardship thing and have people handwrite. This is another place you can get more people involved. The more touches you have, the more, more you have, more um, involvement you have. And in fact, one of the coolest things I got was a thing that wants me to be part of the census. It's bright, it's a postcard. Can it be a stewardship postcard? Can it have photographs? Could you have children draw a picture and say, please give? The sky is the limit on how you could make it distinctive. But here I have all of these requests and none of them are particularly distinctive and I haven't opened them yet. So then finally, how can you share it? One of the things that I would suggest you do is when you get your stewardship letters ready to mail during Sunday worship online, or if you're gathering, 
put them all on the altar and pray a blessing on them and let people know that they're coming. Praying is always a good thing and saying, this is part of the offertory. We are offering your, uh, giving you an opportunity to offer your lives to God. Post it on your website, post it on your Facebook page. Think of all of the different ways you have to share it in addition to mail. Mail is one particularly way, effective way to do it now, but it is not the only way. And so how else can you share that message if you spent so much time creating? So remember, there's only three important parts of your message as you share your mission. We talked about that these are the first three things we learn to say. We learn to say please. We learn to say thank you. We learn to say share. And that's part of the core message of what we are saying in addition to what makes our invitation unique. And oh yes, before we send them out, Always remember to pray. So I'm wondering what thoughts you have and questions you have or creative ideas you have about the stewardship letter. And this is for everybody. So um, if you are watching this right now and you have a question or a comment or an idea, please throw those in the chat. Um, in the comment section and uh, we will respond to them. It's magic. We can respond live. It's amazing. Um, we've had a few comments so far about um, it being very cool that we have a real opportunity to redirect congregational focus. Yes. Yes. How would you redirect? I mean, I think, I think we're at such a unique time I think people are asking questions, they're curious, they're anxious, they're afraid, they're looking for hope. How can this one of many pieces of communication begin to share that story, can begin to move us to whatever the new thing? Um, how are we making a difference through our financial giving with our community right now? Mm -hmm. What are we doing that gives us hope? This is a real opportunity. I would say make it brief. This is not our only opportunity to do that. I would say using color, things like that. But yes, this is such a great opportunity to refocus. Um, and the more people we have involved in creating this, the more ideas we're going to have for that refocusing, I think. Don't you, Ellie? Mm -hmm. We'll have some stuff. If it's just me and the treasurer, it is not going to be very interesting. But if it is a group of people, Again, if you have any children or youth, I would really ask them because I think they would come up with some wonderful, uh, fresh ideas that would help people maybe think in some new ways. Mm -hmm. so that's a really good idea. Um, here's a question from Becca. How are we mindful this season as we write the letter and ask as so many of our people have had financial hardships, job loss, illness, et cetera? Absolutely, I think we acknowledge this. I think we um, make it open somewhere in, I think over and over in our communications that we want to know if people are struggling because we want to support them um, and a way to do that. I think we acknowledge that there's some of us that are not. And so this is an opportunity for us to share. Um, I think somehow in the midst, not just the letter, but in the whole process is to talk about, it never is about the amount never 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 it's about just making this opportunity of giving that what happens to us when we give it changes actually our neurological brain and so that there's no gift that's too small a nickel is not too small but to acknowledge that some people and there's no shame in that this is a point for community to come together and support one another and a special invitation for those like me who have a job to really think about how can i share mm -hmm. and it's biblical Oh, it's, is about, it? it's about giving, not necessarily oh. the amount. I think there's a famous little story about that. It is so not about the amount. It mm -hmm. is so not about the amount, especially for beginning givers. And there's, yeah. Yeah, it's a way to get involved. Um, and I really appreciate when people frame it that way, personally. Um, John asks, uh, any idea how best to handle a follow-up phone call to those who do not respond to the letter? 
Yeah. Um, when we talked last week about creating a timeline, there's a, as many different ways as there are you. It's um, the letter will hopefully not be the only way that you're um, requesting a financial gift. I'm assuming that's, that's not what you're asking. Um, some people have um, a note. It's really helpful. We talked about that it's helpful for your clergy, uh, your rector, your vicar, your head of congregation to know who gives and doesn't. And so if someone doesn't give, that's a really good piece of information about maybe someone has something pastoral going on and so being strategic about who you did. Um, it needs to be what's gonna work within your culture. Um, some churches have a group of people that do follow-up phone calls. Some people get a note. Some people get um, a letter. What, what have you done in the past? Um, again, there's no one or right way, but it needs to be a way that's going to be handled, I think, with sensitivity. Um, but I think, I don't think we have to be afraid of that because especially in my stack of mail, I might have missed the opportunity. I may have been missing online worship. But again, that's why you give lots of opportunities to ask for that so that if they miss the letter, there's other things too. Did that answer the question, Ellie? Yeah, I think so. That uh, uh, any follow-up, including a phone call, there are a lot of ways to do it sensitively by getting to know people, it sounds like. Um, and then also that struck me, I, I don't know where I heard about this practice, but including in your potential response sort of section, like respond to us in this envelope or something like that. Like yes. you can fill it out, not just with a dollar amount, but also with like, what personal gift are you bringing? You know what, you, you could even do something like, I cook a mean casserole and like write that in and respond. Um, so maybe you don't have the financial ability to make a pledge, but you're still involved. And then I, I don't know where I heard that, but no, I, no, I, I like that because um, I, I can remember a time in my life where we had very little money. My husband had been laid off. And so what I did do was I cooked chicken soup every week and delivered it to people. I mean, and so I could do something. And so mm -hmm. there could be a pledge in that way. And maybe those are people that would be happy to write a note or to do something like that as feeling part of your money stewardship. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to get involved. Um, I think that that about does it for all the questions that I see in the chat right now. Um, if other people have more to throw in, please do so. We do have one sort of housekeeping question. Uh, will the slides be posted later? Um, and I don't know if we have a plan for that right now, but if you send us an email, I'm sure we could send you the slides. Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah. You email me. In fact, I'm going to show you another slide. Here's my email, um, bfain at epicenter.org. Uh, you can email me. Um, my phone number is on the diocesan website. I am delighted to answer your call. The other thing that I wanted you to know is that we are, um, tomorrow, I'm going to be sending out some invitations to some people who've indicated some interest to have some deeper conversations around money stewardship um, as we encourage each other, pray with each other and to begin to organize those. And we talked about that a little last week, but we're going to um, actually begin launching those next week. And so if you'd be interested in learning more about that or being part of that, if you'll email me that as well. And so we're gonna pray for everyone as they begin. Usually the money stewardship letter is your first place of communication. And so I think spending time thinking about what it really needs to be about, making sure it's engaging, interesting, something someone wants to open and actually read. The more people you can have involved in that process in creating, praying, mailing, the better it will be. 
uh, because as many touches as you can have different people in the congregation on it, the more communication, because you're hoping to change some behavior to bring some invitation. Certainly acknowledging that this is a unique time. And so we have unique opportunities. What unique things will God invite us to do through funding our mission and ministry, which are words that are helpful to use. Funding mission and ministry, which is about the money stewardship is about. And so we want to be here to support and encourage. We can tell you some ideas that we've read through doing research on what best practices that bring the best results, which is what we're trying to share with you so that in the midst of so many things to do, you'll do what really will make a difference. And so that's where we've tried to share today. Um, so don't hesitate to get in touch if we can help in any way. We are here to partner with you and serve you. And next week, we're gonna have one of the most fun parts, which is going to be all the way, unique ways that we can tell the unique story of who we are. It's not only about money stewardship, it's also another way of doing invite, love and connect and outreach. But as we focus on it in our money stewardship uh, season, it's a really, really fun exercise to do with the whole congregation. So we hope you'll come back next week as we talk about some ideas for telling our story. Uh, but meanwhile, I want to say a prayer for all of us. So the Lord be with you. Thank you. And I'm going to close this up so I can see you all. And now God, for your truth has been spoken, may it grow in our hearts and inform our lives. If any place we've been amiss, we pray that you would gently correct us or just let us forget it. And I pray a blessing on each congregation as we begin our many stewardship processes that as we do that first task of writing the stewardship letter that you will bless us and guide us. And even now, be opening the hearts of those who will receive those letters. That you will do a mighty thing through your church. As each day, more and more, we become disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Go in peace to love and serve. Thanks, Ellie. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who joined us. Um, we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.